Hello, and welcome to this Stearns webinar. My name is Matthew, and I will be your Global Spec Moderator, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading Presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today's session. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window, with background information on today's presenter. And just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed in the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. Now I would like to introduce today's presenter. Peter Tessman. Peter Tessman is the Product and Channel Strategy Manager for Stearns, Berg, and Highfield, all brands of Rexnerd, and is responsible for creating value for end users with highly engineered products. He leads the product applications team, including technical support, estimating, commercial operations, and marketing for Stearns, North America's top supplier of spring set electrically released motor brakes. Peter has experience working with some of the leading crane and hoist OEMs in North America and globally, including product selection, specification creation, NPD, VAVE, and product life cycle management. Peter has earned his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Peter, welcome to today's event. And with that, I will pass things along to you to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for dedicating some time today. Again, I am Peter Tessman with Stearns, and today we'll be covering how to protect your overhead crane from excessive wear and costly downtime. I'll also go through how selecting the proper brake for a new or existing system can extend the life of an overhead crane and improve efficiency and help to meet your current safety requirements. I'm the Product and Channel Strategy Manager at Stearns, managing an entire portfolio, including a complete line of industrial AC and DC clutches, brakes, and solid straight motor start switches. In addition to managing a product applications team for pre- and post-sale support, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the leading crane and hoist OEMs in North America and globally. I hope the information in this webinar will be valuable for you. As we go through this material, I encourage you to leave a comment or question, some of which we will go over at the end. First, we'll take a look at pre-purchase considerations, including crane and hoist service classifications, torque requirements, overhauling dynamic torque, and cycle rates, followed by inspections and preventative maintenance to identify the signs of excessive wear. Lastly, we will end with the corrective maintenance and retrofit options where modernizing a crane or hoist system is necessary. We will review the production conditions that require equipment owners to reevaluate and upgrade their system. Finally, we will leave some time at the end for a Q&A. So as mentioned, please leave questions in the Q&A box and I'll go through as many as I can at the end of the session. The service life of an overhead crane is long lasting when it is properly engineered and maintained from the start. Understanding what your project requires from a crane and hoist will help you select equipment and components that can best meet your project's demands and therefore reduce the risk of wear and tear over time. The key to selecting the right equipment for a particular lifting job is to consider the duty cycle and service classifications using the Crane Manufacturers Association of America, or CMAA, standard. In the next few slides, I'll be walking through the various classifications of lifting equipment based on capacity and usage standards. I will also emphasize the importance of rating your crane drive systems to ensure durability for your load and usage requirements, including torque calculations, overhauling dynamic torque, and cycle rate considerations. CMAA is the Crane Manufacturers Association of America, an independent trade association affiliated with the material handling industry. Its goal is to promote the standardization of cranes, as well as uniform quality and performance. The CMAA has set up standards you can see in front of you based on capacity and usage requirements. These standards are accepted as the industry norm in Canada, the US, and Mexico. 
and are used in the crane manufacturers and installers across the nation to help the end user meet their lifting systems to their application needs. Class A is for standby or infrequent service. Some examples of a typical workday include precise handling at low speeds with idle periods between lifts or capacity loads for initial installation of equipment and infrequent maintenance tasks. Typically, applications requiring this type of crane classification can include powerhouses, utilities, turbine rooms, and transformer stations. Class B is for the light service use. The typical workload for this class is loads varying from no load to occasional full rated loads. Applications can include cranes used in repair shops, light assembly operations, and or light warehousing. Our third classification is Class C, and these cranes are for moderate to service load levels. The workday can include an average of 50% of rated load or 50% less of the lifts are at rated capacity. Types of applications where the service level is required is machine shops, paper mills, and machine rooms. Class D is for heavy service use when average loads approaching 50% are continuously handled and 50% less of the lists at the rated capacity. Applications where these are found are in foundries, fabricating plants, steel warehouses, and lumber yards, to name a few. Class E or severe dirty service are for 24-7 use at or near capacity. Typical applications might include cement mills, fertilizer plants, and container handling. Lastly, Class F or continuous ser severe service is capable of handling loads approaching rated capacity for extremely heavy duty operations. This level of classification is used as a standard specification for electric overhead cranes for steel mill service. Electric hoists have their own set of classifications and standards set by the Hoist Manufacturers Institute, HMI, and the American Society of Engineers, ASME. These classifications are based on five key factors, including first, number of lifts being performed per hour, second, maximum number of starts and stops per hour, third, the average distance the load is raised and lowered, fourth, average and maximum weight to be lifted, and finally, the frequency at which the maximum weight is lifted. When choosing a hoist to best fit your applications, it is important that the hoist rating should meet or exceed your operational requirements. Otherwise, you risk safety issues. Please reference the guide on this slide for duty classifications. But note that uniformly distributed usage is predictable over an hour period, whereas infrequent usage is irregular intervals. Now I'd like to discuss specifying individual components, including drive systems to a specific duty cycle and torque requirement to prevent premature wear or failure. When a brake is being used as a holding brake, static torque should be considered because it is often measured as the breakaway torque or the torque required to overcome the brake. Therefore, if you're using a brake to hold a particular load, you want to select a brake with the proper static or holding torque to ensure the load won't slip. Dynamic torque is the torque required to stop an inertial load. This could be used in linear, rotating, overhauling, or overhung applications, as is in the case with the hoist or winch. Calculating proper dynamic torque will guarantee that your brake will not only stop your load, but also stop your load in time to protect all the equipment within your drive. Some of these calculations we will cover in this section are full motor torque, overhauling torque, heat dissipation, and cycle applications. Starting with full load motor torque. Given motor data, that standard formula for calculating nominal static torque is equal to 5,252 times the horsepower divided by RPM of the motor shaft times the service factor, which can vary depending on application requirements. The most common industrial AC motors are designed class B, which develop normal starting torque with relatively low starting current. These motors are suitable for a full voltage across the line starting and can typically develop 135 to 150% of full load torque during starting. At Stearns, we typically use a service factor of 1.4. This means that our recommendation is that the torque rating on the brake be 140% of full load motor torque. An electric motor brake is typically designed to produce 140% of full load torque. 
so the motor is not able to simply drive through the brake if the brake is not properly released. If the motor is held by the brake without rotation, the motor will demand locked rotor current, which will tend to make the motor thermal overload protection disconnect the motor and brake from the power line in a timely manner. Overhauling loads, such as a crane, hoist, or elevator, have two requirements. The braking torque required to stop the load and the torque required to hold the load at rest. See the formula for calculating dynamic torque for overhauling load applications. Dynamic torque is equal to 0.158 times the weight of the load times the velocity of the load, which is the rate of descent of the load measured in feet per minute. This is divided by the RPM of the shaft at the brake. When we mention RPM of the motor, we're referring to the speed of the motor itself. In other words, if you're using a gearbox that will slow the speed of the output shaft, we're referring to just the RPM before going into the gearbox. When calculating brake torque, we are considering the speed of the shaft at the brake. In general, a brake will repetitively stop a load at the duty cycle that a standard electric motor can repetitively start the load. A brake's thermal capacity is based upon the heat it can absorb and dissipate while cycling. Cycle rate describes how frequently the brake is used within a work period and is measured in cycles per minute. With brake friction generating heat, cycle rates affect thermal sizing and selection. Interior surface temperatures of the brake enclosure must be limited so it can function at maximum cycle rate within the rated duty cycle without dehydrating or carbonization of dust. If productivity of an operation is to be improved by increasing cycle rate, the maximum number of stops per minute is determined by the rated thermal capacity of the brake. See examples of how to calculate heat dissipation cycle applications. Cycle rate cannot exceed the recommendations as determined by the manufacturer. Please see the table on the slide for Stern's maximum solenoid cycle rates for our portfolio of brakes. Duty cycle, on the other hand, can be expressed as a ratio of time a drive is on versus off or a crane and hoist rated capacity to continuously perform work under normal conditions. Avoid costly downtime by implementing a preventative maintenance program for your crane equipment or individual drive system components. Scheduled maintenance can help you identify signs of wear so that you may be able to replace or upgrade individual components to have better performance and require less maintenance and therefore less downtime going forward. Ensuring a degree of safety is the biggest challenge for overhead crane owners. Continued training and a thorough understanding of the equipment as well as the CMAA inspection standards make sure your overhead cranes and hoists are working properly and wearing as expected. The CMAA has a well-defined maintenance checklist that can help guide you to individually inspect components in a hoist system. Check with your crane manufacturer for other useful maintenance tips and guidance. All motor brakes are supplied with insulation, service, and safety instructions. These should be read carefully upon receipt of the brake and carried out by a licensed technician using the correct tools. The maintenance procedure on the screen is provided to help to ensure trouble-free brake operation, determine the amount of disc wear by inspection of disc thickness or notable increases in noise, increase in stop time or decrease in holding capacity, also known as slipping. All of this is to ensure that the components are properly cleaned, use a quick evaporating non-oil based cleaner, such as a brake cleaner to remove grease or grime from brake components. Worn or damaged gaskets or seals are one of the most common causes of water ingress or intrusion in a brake. For the few dollars you spend on a new gasket and a tube of gasket loop, you can save hundreds if not thousands of dollars in downtime, repair, and or replacement of brakes and brake components. Friction discs specifically depend on numerous variables including the number and frequency of dynamic stops, stop time, inertial load, and ambient temperature, which is difficult to define on a regular schedule for disc pack inspections or replacements. Each facility should determine their own maintenance program depending on the application specified within their operations. For solenoid actuated brakes or NEMA AC motor brakes, at least an annual inspection of the electrical contact points of a solenoid should be conducted. See the checklist for a visual check of the brake support plate. 
All friction brakes require adjustment to compensate for friction disc wear. Manual adjust brakes require routine air gap inspections and air gap adjustments. Self-adjusting brakes do not require these same routine adjustments and prevent the downtime required. The friction disc image here is showing levels of wear and damage to the disc pack when the motor has driven through a set brake. The first indication that this has occurred can be the smoke emitted from the brake. The friction disc on the far left has a normal factory burnish and is ready to use. The friction disc on the far right has a more prominent burnish pattern and is starting to glaze. If it completely glazes over and the brake torque is affected, this can be scuffed up with emery cloth, just enough to break up the glazing and the disc will again be good for use. The friction disc in the center has been driven through. It's burnt, it is blistered, charred, and these are signs that the friction disc resins have started to liquefy. If this is the case, the disc should be discarded and replaced. The brass stationary disc on each side of the center friction disc have signs of heat discoloration and have started to crack. These stationary discs are severely heat damaged and should be replaced. Next, inspect the solenoid contact points on the frame and the plunger as well as the shading coils. Also check that the support plate and solenoid mounting bolts for wear and or loosening of the bolts. If factory specifications for tightening were followed at installation, there should be no loosening of these bolts. Finally, check the link bolt for wear or damaged threads at the nut. Also look for elongatedness of the bolt hole, which will eventually cause damage to and failure of the bolt. It can be much more cost effective to upgrade or modify components in an existing crane than by an entirely new system. In this section, we will be discussing in which scenarios you should be considering a system upgrade and why as well as what types of upgrades are feasible and most cost effective. Upgrading components in a crane system usually comes down to changes in your manufacturing or production processes. Components specified during the crane's installation may become undersized for an application when manufacturing needs to change. These can include the need for increased lifting weight, increased operation speed, increased frequency of usage, or lastly, the need for more precise control over a crane or hoist system. Any of those types of changes can create additional wear and tear on individual components. In the next few slides, we will review these conditions and our recommendations to extend the drive's operating life, as well as how to protect against frequent repairs and downtime. Making heavier lifts can put strain on the crane equipment and often demands that the duty cycle and service classifications of the brake and crane be reevaluated. One of the first things you should do to determine the total weight of a new load is to consider the type of crane or equipment being used, the type of lifting hardware such as slings, rigging, or hook devices, and the hitch or sling angle. The total weight of the load must account for all the equipment in the lifting system. To calculate the overhauling dynamic torque, use the equation that's on the slide. Within the CMAA specifications is a numerical method for determining exact crane class based on expected load spectrum. Use the CMAA load class table to determine which class your application falls under. Increased load or lifting requirements can increase the heat of the disc back and therefore contribute to wear. Consider thermostats to monitor when a brake has reached its given temperature limit. This upgrade is used to prevent damage to the brake and keep temperature below the flash point of hazardous materials. Wear indicating switches might also be a viable upgrade to an existing system to monitor wear and eliminate downtime by having to periodically open the brake to inspect disc wear. If you require faster operation to efficiently perform lifts, more so than when the system was first purchased and installed, you may need to reevaluate if your brake's inertial torque. This may be the case in overhead cranes that have direct paths or cranes that have the product up and over obstacles instead of navigating back and forth throughout a warehouse. Torque and power reduction can be significant in case of vertical linear applications. The main purpose of a holding brake is to relieve the motor from maintaining the holding torque during standstill periods in a vertical linear motion application. For linear horizontal applications, the total torque of the application will be zero during most standstill and the motor does not need to maintain a holding torque. Holding brakes may not be necessary. The final decision to apply a brake should only be based on calculating the torque requirements. Total inertia reflected to the brake is equal to the total weight of the moving load 
times the linear velocity of the moving load as measured in feet per minute. Divide all of this by 2 times pi times the motor shaft at the brake squared. The friction disc is the most critical component for stopping and holding a load. Check with your brake manufacturer to learn more about specialized friction disc options. For example, Stearns offers a standy duty disc as well as a heavy duty friction disc. The heavy duty friction disc protects against the impact it will receive due to heavy shock loads and instant reverse applications. We also offer a high inertia friction disc that can withstand heat generated from high cycle rates, high inertia, and or high speed applications. Carrier ring friction disc assemblies are also available and often preferred in high risk applications. This is an application where an added layer of protection is needed. If for any reason the friction material breaks down over time, that metal disc is then there as a stopping surface. If your requirements have changed and you're now making more lifts per shift or per 24 hour period, you may consider upgrading the crane's equipment's rated capacity. CMAA classifications are established based on the crane's average load intensity and number of lift cycles. If two cranes exactly match capacity and size but differ in load weight and loading cycles, there may be a long-term effect on the equipment that is overperforming. Engineers need to consider system fatigue and component durability when there is a change in production to ensure that the working condition of the crane system has not changed. For high cycle applications or for use in heat, high heat ambient environments, coils with class H rated insulation are often preferred. Class H maximizes the temperature and its limit is 180 degrees Celsius or 356 degrees Fahrenheit. Coils with Class H insulation are often preferred over Class B insulated coils. In the case of needing more precise controls, cycle rate, inertial load, and thermal capacity should be re-evaluated. An example of a precision application could be using crane control systems that are safer and more efficient alternatives to using open or enclosed operating cabs. The operator maneuvers the equipment safely from the ground. These highly automated systems can maneuver with the precision of one thousandth of the rated speed to the exact location. Overhead crane brake systems often benefit from feedback equipment such as brake status switches and sensors, as well as wear and heat sensors. For precision control applications, there are a few brake feedback modifications available. Stearns offers a brake release indicator switch or a proximity sensor that can track when the brake is released and when the brake is set. If your brake is not releasing when you need it to re release, this would obviously alert you that the brake is in need some sort of need of maintenance attention and that the operation should be paused until the issue is resolved. Used in positioning or robotics and automation, an encoder brake can be provided to track shift rotation to aid in the positioning and feedback throughout the robotic process or process of the automation. If your crane equipment runs continuously and without the help of an operator, the encoder brake allows you to set parameters to keep the machine operational without supervision. Stearns does offer internal encoders with a specifically designed hub to bridge the gap from a standard commercial NEMA brake motor shaft to engage the encoder inside the brake. At this time, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. As I have reviewed, there are many guidelines to follow to ensure best fit performance and service life in the field. Stearns is the leading manufacturer of springs, spring set motor brakes in North America, and with over 100 years of experience and expertise, in the industrial brake and clutch markets. We offer a comprehensive line of standard and special mm -hmm. AC and DC industrial brakes and clutches, along with a local factory trained sales force to work with you and your maintenance staff and plant engineers when needed. To learn more about us, please feel free to visit us at our websites at www.sternsbrakes.com. Thank you everyone for submitting questions uh, and comments about the webinar. Right now we'll uh, take a few of your questions on. The first one is, why do brakes get hot and can anything be done about it? Brakes generate some amount of heat, but if they are getting hot repeatedly or overheating, it's most likely due to disc drag. The most common occurrence for this is uh, using a brake that was manufactured for horizontal mounting in a vertical position. Vertically mounted brakes uh, or brakes that are mounted to the vertical mounted 
motors require mo modification for the vertical mount. You could check with the brake manufacturer and inquire about the availability uh, of vertical mounted brakes or even field retrofit kits uh, to convert a horizontally brake um, to a vertical mount. You should also specify whether the brake is being mounted above or below the motor as it can affect the orientation of the springs used to support the disc pack and keep it from dragging. You may also want to check for other mechanical issues that may be causing the disc to drag, for example, an improperly adjusted air gap. Try to determine if there's ample clearance between the discs when the brakes is supposed to be released. If there's not, consult the brake manufacturer if the cause cannot be determined. If power is being sent to a brake through a VFD or variable frequency drive, you'll need to switch to sending power to the brake from a dedicated separated contactor as dropping frequency to control motor speed or ramping up frequency at start will affect the magnetism that keeps the brake released. The brake won't set while the motor is driving or not release at startup. The brake coil needs to receive its rated voltage at a consistent frequency to keep the brake released whenever the motor is driving. Most VFDs are equipped with an auxiliary contactor that is separate from the VFD and can be utilized for sending power to the brake. Another idea would be hub position. This can also affect brake temperature. If the hub is misplaced um, or not having the correct contact with other components inside the brakes, uh, it can cause excessive heat. Metal on metal contact between the hub and the pressure plate or hub and end plate can cause the brake to overheat as the hub is rotating at full speed, typically 1,000 to 1,800 RPM. Another question that came up are about brakes on gantry systems um, that have been locking up. Sometimes this is due to rust and sometimes it's due to ice inside the brakes when temperatures drop well below freezing. Uh, in order to solve this, first you have to confirm if the brake has sufficient ingress protection or IP rating for outdoor use, and if not, then the cause of the water getting into the brake. Brakes constantly exposed to the elements and outdoor applications should typically have an IP rating of 56 or, or greater. If the brake is rated for IP56 or higher and water is still getting aside, you really need to check all the gaskets and seals to assure they're in good shape and properly maintained. Um, the brake can also be open and inspected to precisely where and how water is entering. Brakes mounted to vertically mounted fan cooled motors with the brake below the motor can take on water from the brake face at the fan guard and the fan guard then acts like a funneling channel and allows water to pool in the mounting face of the brake. So depending on your applications even some of your auxiliary parts or components can can add to an otherwise fully insulated brake. Um, make sure to check buildup of condensation. Um, and also if you're using space heaters, make sure drain holes are provided uh, to eliminate some backup. Our next question is about friction discs and uh, they're where, so we have an example where friction discs are wearing at a very fast rate and they're wondering what the cause could be. Uh, this could mean the brake is undersized for the application uh, as your is your first starting point. You should check with the brake manufacturer to learn if the brake was sized correctly when installed and be prepared to offer all the necessary data that the application specialist would need. Some of that would be examples. Some examples would be um, horsepower, RPM, cycle rate, duty cycle, inertia, reflected to the shaft, uh, and so on. If inertia is, is not known, they will at least need to know the total weight and velocity in feet per minute of the load. Or if a gearbox is used between the brake and the load, they will need to know the shaft speed at the brake and the shaft speed at the load or the gear ratio. Our next question that came in is uh, in reference to installing a spring engaged electrically, electrically released brake on a new hoist and the brake is allowing the load to drift from one to two feet whenever it's stopped on the down cycle. Um, it doesn't appear when lifting the load, but it does occur when I'm lowering the load. Uh, so are there any ideas on this? Um, if you have confirmed that the brake is not undersized for the load, I would then check to see if there is a delay in the setting or engaging of the brake from the time when the power is shut off um, to the brake. If this is the case, then the brake is wired into the motor, thus getting its power from the motor. 
then this issue is caused by a residual current from the motor keeping the brake release for an extra second or two. The issue can be solved by powering the brake directly from a dedicated contactor that is separate from the motor. Our next question uh, looks like a bit of a use case scenario. Uh, we recently installed some new brake motors on our gantry drive and while we were running our tests, the brakes got very hot and we noticed smoke coming out of them. One of our guys said that's because the motors are vertically mounted with the brakes above the motor that we should have gotten brakes that were modified for vertical. How can we tell if our brakes were modified for vertical or not? And if they weren't, can we modify them in the field or do we need to order new brakes? So multi-disc brakes that are modified for vertical mounting will typically have springs between the discs. Uh, these springs support the weight of the disc pack to mitigate any potential for disc drag. Most brakes should be able to be modified in the field. Check with your brake manufacturer for the availability of a vertical conversion kit uh, like we talked about, which Stearns offers. The next question is, uh, is another application question that looks like. We have a brake on our trolley drive. I thought the brake was supposed to stop the trolley, but it always drifts a bit. It basically coasts to a stop, but we need it to stop when we cut the power to the drive. Uh, so as I mentioned a few questions ago regarding a hoist application, if you can confirm that the brake is not undersized for the load, it's then best to see if there's a delay in the setting or engaging of the brake from the time when the power is shut off to the brake. If this is the case, then the brake is wired in with the motor and it needs to be changed to a dedicated separate contactor. However, if the brake is wired directly to a dedicated separate contactor, but there's still a delay in the brake engaging, then the issue most likely is the timing interval with the contactor relay, and this may need to be adjusted in order for the brake to set one to two seconds sooner. Our next question, comment rather, is we have brakes on our gantry drive that are supposed to be set for outdoor use, but some of them are still taking on water. How can this be happening? So if you have confirmed that the brake has sufficient IP rating and that the gaskets and seals are properly maintained, it would be beneficial to open up the brake to see if there's any obviously obvious wear um, and indication of how the water is entering the brake. If the brake is mounted below a vertical mounted fan cooled motor, then water is most likely coming in at the mounting face of the brake. The fan guard is funneling water into the brake face at this point. If this is the case, check with the brake manufacturer on the availability of any field retrofit kits for sealing the brake face. You should also consider the possibility of condensation building up inside the brake enclosure. Check with the brake manufacturer of the availability of space heaters to regulate temperature and control the condensation inside the brake. You can also check for drain holes. Uh, for instance, stern brakes are equipped with a 1 8 inch drain hole tapped with national pipe thread NPT uh, for the use of removable and replaceable plugs. Looks like we have time for one more question. Um, so this one is in regards if Stearns has any plans uh, to set up um, to develop brakes for the increasing interest and focus on Ethernet or wireless feedback from the brakes. Uh, in other words, are you Stearns implementing sensors, monitors with your brakes that store useful data to the end user. So Rexnord, our parent company, has made significant investments into our direction platform. It's a digital IIoT platform through which our customers can determine their needs um, of a structure and a system accordingly. You can find more information on this at rexnord.com, R-E-X-N-O-R-D.com, specifically under products, smart solutions, and then direction, D-I-R-X-N, digital productivity. For the Stearns brakes, we have developed and designed and performed testing to be compatible with the direction platform, um, including integrated switchers, uh, wear sensing, temperature monitoring, and so on. Um, a lot of these are core performance or preventative maintenance leading indicators to help you uh, minimize downtime. Using this information, uh, you can really figure out where your key factors are that are upsetting uh, your performance um, to prevent that that maintenance and downtime or a way a lot of our customers are using them are to increase efficiency and throughput of their device. Uh, in some cases they're also used for safety. 
Um, so with that, uh, we are at time. I want to thank everyone for, for taking this uh, half hour, a little bit over to go through some of the stuff. Great questions and feedback. Um, if you have any uh, ongoing questions, you know, please reach out uh, to me personally, Peter Tessman, um, or contact us at www.sternsbreaks.com. Thank you. Bye. All right. We're going to wrap things up right there. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you for taking the time to answer some audience questions. We'd like to also thank all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. You will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation, so you will be able to come back and watch this again or share it with your colleagues. Lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey which will appear on your screen at the end of this live webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar event. Take care, and we will talk with you soon.